what they get to do for the year. Yeah, three different times I've gotten it. Yeah, three different times I've gotten it. 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 Okay. Uh, let's see. If you got gappers, I'll take it. How's that? Is that all right?
card. Can you get those cards? Oh. Can you move your card out, please? We're going to Oh, yeah. Card? Yeah. 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 Thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, my name is Carla Red. I'm the chief of the Rockford Police Department. The spelling is Carla, C-A-R-L-A. Last name is Red, R-E-D-D. -D. I'm here today to provide you with an update on the horrific events that unfolded in our community yesterday. Uh, of course, with everything that transpired, our community is hurting because of the senseless act of violence that took place. Uh, just as a recap, we have four victims that are deceased, five in the city that were injured, four of those injured individuals were treated and released. We have one victim that is currently still in the hospital and listed in stable condition. 22-year-old Christian Soto is in custody and being charged with the heinous acts that took place yesterday. 
We have no other indications or any other reports that anyone else was involved in the events yesterday besides Soto. We received numerous, numerous calls yesterday from residents who saw por portions of the violence unfolding. I definitely want to thank those community members that stepped up and made those calls to 911 because it enabled for us to get there quicker and get to the right locations. Law enforcement, our first responders across the board did a phenomenal job with getting to the scene, rendering aid as quickly as they did. And on a daily basis, day in and day out, they do an outstanding job serving and protecting this community. I also want to say thank you to Rockford Public School District as well as Rosecrans for stepping up and taking the lead and starting those efforts to help our community begin to heal. They're providing counseling services at uh, Flynn Middle School today and tomorrow to the community. I will add just real quick, I did get a phone call in regards to the numerous community members that were showing up for the services to the point that they even had to call in extra counselors. With that being said, definitely we're concerned about the community, but I'm also concerned about our first responders. So we are diligently working with our EAP program to get our first responders the services that they need to make sure that they're well so they can continue to serve the community. Um, you're gonna hear from numerous others on our team that have been boots on the ground and providing the services and there will be more information that will come out as well in regards to the victims and details of the charges that have been brought on Soto. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Winnebago County Sheriff Gary Caruana. You're welcome. Thank you um, for coming out and um, covering the situation, which is a tragic, tragic situation in our uh, Winnebago County Rockford region. I do want to thank um, all the law enforcement agencies that were involved in this, the, uh, from the uh, feds to all of <coughs> our partners, um, county and city and, and everybody that was involved out there and the fire departments, Cherry Valley Fire Department, Rockford Fire Department, that helped us put this together and transported um, the victims. So the situation came out that there was a, uh, a, a person that was um, on the loose stabbing. We didn't know what we had. Uh, we know we had a situation, very uh, serious situation at the time. Um, so the county in that area, it goes in and out of the city, county, and we back each other up all the time. Uh, we responded to the situation where it was occurring um, in the uh, Skokie, Cleveland, Homes area. Um, at that time, we were also heard that we were being dispatched to the area of 2100 Eggleston, which is in the county, and we responded there along with Rockford. Um, and what we found was there was a good Samaritan that uh, was helping uh, one of the ladies that was a home invasion. She ran from the home uh, on Florence and was uh, tackled there at 2100 uh, block of Eggleston, and he was in the pr process of stabbing her. The Good Samaritan stopped that situation and she could have easily been deceased if he did not become involved with that. He ran off, came back, tried to get into his Jeep and he was actually stabbed also, but he did a tremendous job in helping. At that time, city county squads arrived and, um, and um, the chase ensued. Uh, one of the deputies was able to jump over several fences, was able to get him apprehended right behind them where Rockford PD and that's for the point where they took him into custody. Um, again, heartfelt um, sorrow for the community. I wanna thank all the people that are providing um, help to the community um, and to the first responders. And I wanna, again, my condolences to the family and um, just a tremendous job of all of our teams coming together, working together again with our local law enforcement and the feds. So. Um, I appreciate your concerns for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to the County Board Chairman, Jill Shirelli. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. I wanna thank the um, Chief Red and the entire Rockford Police Department. I wanna thank the entire Rockford Fire Department and the Sheriff's Department. 
our sincere gratitude for all of the first responders that ended the threat and kept our survivors safe. It is imperative that we all understand that the collaboration that has occurred in this tragedy was not by accident. We want to ensure the citizens of Winnebago County that we are doing as much as we can by resources, financial and otherwise, and our human capital to have the best trained and the most equipped to handle these types of situations. My sincerest condolences on behalf of Winnebago County residents to the families. Um, it's an unimaginable what they're enduring at this point in time. But I want to ensure them and the rest of the community that we're doing as much as possible to always keep everyone as safe as possible in, their, in Winnebago County. As a former alderman of this area, <clears throat> it touches me deeply in my heart that I represented the same people that were affected yesterday by this horrifying tragedy. <coughs> and going back in time and serving them and having neighborhood meetings in that exact area where these murders occurred, knowing the quality of their minds and their hearts, how they only want the best for our community and to be in a position of this tragedy is unimaginable for me. So my sincerest um, gratitude for them keeping their strength and helping assist the first responders and my sincerest condolences to the people who lost their families in this area. So again, we will do as much as we can to keep the multi-jurisdictional cooperation going for the future. And I also want to say here that please respect the families, uh, the media, all citizens, please respect the family's time in their, in their morning. There will be a time to reach out to them, but they need this space right now with the therapist and the counseling. And um, that would be my number one request today is to make sure you respect the families. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Tom McNamara. I'm mayor of the city of Rockford. I, I want to begin today uh, first speaking on behalf of the Winnebago County Coroner's Office. Uh, I've been asked to release the names of those uh, that are deceased from yesterday's horrific incident. They are 63-year-old Ramona Schubach, 23-year-old Jacob Schubach, 49-year-old Jay Larson, 15-year-old Jenna Newcomb, 15-year-old uh, wants the community to know that Jenna died saving her sister and her friend and protecting them from further harm. It's pretty difficult to even know where to begin to describe what's taking place. Our community has experienced such unthinkable tragedies this week. Before I begin to talk about yesterday's incident, I do want to acknowledge that we as a community are still pro processing the exceptional loss of Jason Jenkins. His family and, and loved ones have been on our minds and in our hearts since Sunday. I do want to say Jason needs to be lifted up. He was a church going young man. He was a man of many accomplishments. He would set goals. He was loved by all who knew him. And his family wants people to know that he was more than just this victim, that he was exceptional. So here we are four days later, addressing yet another horrendous incident right here in Rockford. 
I do echo the comments of previous speakers and I want to thank the law enforcement officers from multiple jurisdictions for truly incredible work. In a quick response, in responding to and apprehending the suspects, the suspect of yesterday's tragedy. I also want to thank our first responders from the dispatchers to the EMTs to the amazing hospital staff for their care and their compassion during the toughest of situations. I specifically do also want to call out the coroner's office, their staff for their work and their dedication. It's an incredibly difficult task that they have. We know that they are going through a lot and recognize their entire team. So the suspect is now in the hands of the court system and we expect he will be held responsible to the fullest extent of the law. But our focus today and in the coming weeks as mayor of Rockford is taking care of those directly impacted in our community at large, specifically the loved ones of Jason Jenkins, Ramona Schubach, Jacob Schubach, Jay Larson, and young Jenna Newcomb. The trauma of this magnitude impacts all of us. These are dark days, uh, but we as Rockfordians will get through this. As we speak right now, there's counselors over at Flynn Middle School with first responders. As the chief mentioned, I can report that these services are having a great impact. People are taking advantage of these services. As the chief reported, they've even had to add additional counselors. And again, I sincere thank you uh, to Rose Grants uh, from their leadership uh, with Dave Gomel to the counselors who are showing up at Flynn Middle School, to Rockford Public Schools, Dr. Aaron Jarrett uh, and his facilities team for helping work so quickly to make this available to those who are just absolutely hurting. However, this is absolutely just the beginning of our community healing and those families beginning to heal. I also wanna know, uh, let Rockford know that we're not alone. I've heard already from the governor, I think from every federal legislator that represents our area, including the White House, all offering their support and acknowledging the impact of the trauma that our community is facing. Our community must continue to come together and lift each other up. Unfortunately, we have been here before. We've experienced great loss and we've shown tremendous strength and resiliency by supporting one another and coming together. Kindness and compassion must lead us as we move forward. And I will say every single person in our community can do something. We can be kind to our neighbors and be thoughtful in the words that we use in the conversations with others. If the last couple days doesn't show you, life is just far too short to speak hate. More than ever, the people who are most impacted by this horrific event need to see our community linking arms, not pointing fingers, but working together with an aligned vision of healing and moving Rockford forward as one Rockford. With that, I'm gonna, I have the opportunity to introduce Ruth Mendoza. My condolences to your entire team. Ruth is the inspector in charge of the U.S. Postal Inspection Service from Chicago. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. I'm Ruth Mendonca, U.S. Postal Inspector, Inspector in Charge of the Chicago Division of the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. It is with great sadness that I extend my deepest condolences to the family of the victims, the community of Rockford, and my own Postal Service family. A 25-year veteran of the U.S. Postal Service, letter carrier Jay Larson, 
was taken from his family and from this community yesterday. This tragedy occurred while Jay was doing his job, like many of us were at that exact time. Jay was doing what he loved, serving his community, delivering mail to customers that he has served for 25 years. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service is the federal law enforcement branch of the U.S. Postal Service. It is our mission to investigate crimes involving letter carriers and to hold those responsible accountable. We thank the many first responders who urgently answered yesterday's call for help. We appreciate the outstanding collaboration and professionalism of the Rockford Police Department, the Sheriff, and all the law enforcement personnel in this area. Postal inspectors will continue to provide whatever assistance is needed for however long it's necessary. Thank you, Chief Carla Red, Sheriff, for your leadership, and thank you to the brave detectives, officers, first responders, firefighters of the Rockford area, and all of the law enforcement partners here today. Thank you. Uh, State's Attorney, Jay Hanley. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jay Hanley. I'm the Winnebago County State's Attorney. Today, I'm going to go through uh, the charges um, against uh, Christian Soto. Um, I'm also going to provide a factual summary. Um, before that, though, I want to briefly describe just the charging process uh, here in Win and generally how it occurs here in Winnebago County um, and then how it's occurring with respect to Christian Soto. So, uh, Law enforcement investigated the crime. Uh, they, you know, do the investigation. Uh, we aid in that sometimes where it's search warrants or, or the like, uh, which is what occurred here. Uh, then they present the case to us um, for charges. We apply the facts, the investigation that they've done to the law and determine what should be charged. Um, I think most people understand that. Um, here in Winnebago County, what usually happens is um, someone is initially charged by what's called a criminal complaint. So an, an officer, detective prepares that criminal complaint and they also prepare a factual summary. Uh, the charging process is not done at that point. Uh, as again, most of you know, we ultimately will take that case before a grand jury and indict that case. And, and the reason I discuss that is for a number of reasons. First, the charges that I'm listing today, um, there may be more charges and, and I think there probably will be more charges at the time that we present this to the grand jury. Uh, we're still, you know, whatever, 48 hours roughly, even less, uh, 24 hours from the incident. And so it's, we're still, um, the investigation continues. It's not over by any means. Um, at the same time, we have charged Mr. Soto. I wanna talk a little bit about what's gonna happen at 1.30 today. So he was lodged in the Winnebago County Jail last night. Um, he'll appear at initial appearance court in courtroom B today at 1.30. Um, at that time, he'll be notified of the charges against him, and we will file what's called a petition to deny his pretrial release. We're obviously going to seek that he be detained while he awaits trial. The judge will ultimately make that determination. As part of that process, during that hearing, we will present uh, a summary of the facts in this case. And that's both to justify the charges themselves, but to also show um, the court that Mr. Soto is a danger to the community. That factual summary will actually become, and the charges themselves will become public information. In fact, they could be right now, um, as of 11.30, they weren't. Um, one of the things that we're gonna do is, for some of you who are gonna show up at 1.30 today in courtroom B, um, our PIO will be there and she will actually have the complaints and the factual summaries there for you. We're gonna get into this. I'm gonna read them verbatim to you today. Um, but at the same time, whether it's spellings of names, dates of birth, all of that, you can actually, we'll give those to you. Um, like I said, if they're not public information right now, uh, they certainly will be at 1.30. Christian Ivan Soto, date of birth, November 23rd, 2001, is charged as follows. Let me back up. There's two separate complaints. Some of you may recall that most of the incidents occurred in Rockford, Illinois. One particular incident, especially two counts of attempt murder occurred in Winnebago County. So there's two separate complaints. 
At the time of indictment, there won't be that separation. But today I'm gonna to refer to them as the city complaint and the county complaint. I'm gonna start with the city complaint. Count one of one, count one of 11, pardon. On March 27, 2024, in Winnebago County, Christian Ivan Soto committed the offense of first degree murder. That's the murder of Jacob Schupak. Count two of 11, March 27, 2024, Christian Ivan so Soto committed the offense of first degree murder. The victim in that case, Ramona Schubeck. Count three of 11, on March 27th, Christian Ivan Soto committed the offense of first degree murder. The victim in that case, Jay Larson. Count four of 11, March 27, 2024, Christian Ivan Soto committed the offense of first degree murder. The victim in that case is J-A-N, date of birth 4-1-2008. Count five of 11, Christian Ivan Soto on March 27, 2024, committed the offense of attempt, first degree murder. The victim in that case, initials SDN 6-9-2009. Those initials are because those victims are juveniles. Count six of 11, March 27, 2024, Christian Ivan Soto committed the offense of attempt, first degree murder. The victim, KIA, date of birth 5-16-2008. Count seven of 11, attempt, first degree murder, March 27, 2024, Christian Ivan Soto committed attempt first degree murder, the victim Darlene Weber. March 27, 2024, Christian Ivan Soto committed the offense of attempt first degree murder, the victim Jacob Volman. Count nine of 11, on March 27, Christian Ivan Soto committed the offense of attempt first degree murder, the victim Kathy Gilfillan. Counts 10 and 11 are home invasion. Then on March 27th, Christian Ivan Soto committed home invasion with a dangerous weapon at 4715 Cleveland Avenue. <clears throat> Count 11 of 11 reads identically, but the address is that of 4803 Cleveland Avenue. Those are the counts within the city complaint. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, pretty much verbatim the factual summary, which is approximately three pages long. Uh, underlying those offenses. On Wednesday, March 27, 2024, Rockford police officers responded to 2316 Holm Street in reference to an individual being run over by a vehicle and possibly stabbed. Upon officers' arrival, they conducted a welfare check at 2316 Holm Street, at which time they located a male and female deceased inside the residence. They were identified as Jacob Schubeck and Ramona Schubeck. Both victims appeared to have been stabbed. Witnesses advised they had observed Jacob being chased across the street by a subject who was later identified as Christian Ivan Soto. Witnesses stated they observed Christian Soto in possession of an unknown, possibly black object that he was hitting or stabbing Jacob with as he was lying on the ground. It was then observed by witnesses that the suspect entered a black Chevy Silverado, which had been parked in the driveway of 2316 Home Street and proceeded to run over Jacob at the end of the driveway. Jacob was observed getting up and running back into his residence. Soto was observed running back into 2316 Home Street and exiting a short time later. Soto re-entered his black Chevy Silverado and was last seen southbound on Home Street. In regards to the events of 2316 Home Street, Soto was later interviewed after being advised of his Miranda rights by detectives. Soto admitted to being friends with Jacob and going over to his residence to smoke marijuana. Soto said he believes that Drugs provided to him by Jacob were, quote, laced, unquote, with an unknown narcotic. Soto said he became paranoid after the drug usage. He said he retrieved a knife from the kitchen at Jacob's house and proceeded to stab Jacob and Ramona to death. He could not recall a description of the knife. Soto stated he then left the residence in his vehicle and he recalled taking out the mailman. The attack on the United States postal worker took place in the 2200 block of Winnetka Lane. Officers located United States Post Office employee Jay Larson, who had suffered multiple stab wounds in his body in the front yard of 2217 Winneka Avenue. He was transferred, transferred to a hospital nearby, where he later succumbed to his injuries. Officers spoke with a witness named, with a witness who resided at 2217 Winneka Avenue. That witness advised he was inside his residence when he heard a commotion outside. He looked and observed a male battering United States postal worker who he referred to as his mailman, in the grass area near the front of his residence. 
He observed the suspect on top of the mailman punching him. He said he opened his front door. He heard the, L -man, he heard the mailman yell for him to call the police. As he dialed 911, he observed the suspect begin to walk towards his front door. He said he quickly locked the front door at that point and continued to watch the incident through his window. He watched the subject walk back to a black pickup truck nearby and retrieve a knife from the vehicle. He described the knife as being distinctive due to have it, it having an orange handle. The suspect approached the mailman again and stamped him numerous times in various parts of his body. He stated the suspect entered the driver's seat of the pickup truck, drove forward, and ran over Larson. He said the suspect struck a parked vehicle nearby. The suspect reversed the pickup truck and ran over Larson a second time with the vehicle. The witness said the pick, pickup truck briefly stopped and he observed the suspect run away between the houses nearby. The witness was transported to District 2, Rockford Police Department, where he was shown a photo lineup. He possibly, positively identified Christian Ivan Soto as the individual he observed stabbing the United States postal worker and running over him with his truck. Soto, as indicated above, was interviewed after being advised of his Miranda rights. He admitted that he recognized the mailman who was walking in the street holding mail that he was delivering. He admitted that he stabbed the mailman and tried to run over him with his truck. Officers also began to receive 911 calls about an attack at 40, or I'm sorry, 4803 Cleveland Avenue. Upon their arrival, they met with Darlene Weber and her son, Jacob Bullman, and her daughter, Kathy Gilfillan. Officers learned the suspect, again later identified as Soto, forced his way into the residence and was armed with a katana-style knife. Darlene had just opened the door to the residence to allow, to allow their dog outside. At this time, Soto appeared at the doorway and stabbed Darlene in the left side of her face by her left eye. Soto then entered the residence and attacked Jacob and Kathy, who attempted to fight Soto off. Kathy sustained a stab wound to the lower left side of her chin, and Jacob sustained a laceration to the upper left side of his forehead and also the inside of the left side of his ear. Jacob was unsure if he was stabbed or if he sustained the injuries from Soto punching him. Jacob advised he struck, struck Soto with a syrup bottle, at which time Soto left the residence. Darlene, Jacob, and Kathy were all transported to a hospital where they were treated for non-life-threatening injuries and were later released. Again, after being advised of his Miranda rights, Soto admitted to entering the residence and attacking three people with a knife. He recalled the residents having a pit bull and the dog biting him on his leg while at the residence. He fled the residence on foot. Officers were then flagged down by subjects being, st were then flagged down about subjects being stabbed at 4715 Cleveland Avenue. As officers were responding to the multiple reported crime scenes, Rockford Fire Department was flagged down by a female in the 4700 block of Cleveland Avenue, who reported additional injured persons at 4715 Cleveland Avenue. Within that residence, officers located two injured juvenile females, SDN and KIA, along with a deceased juvenile female, JAN. They were deceased within the basement of 4715. She was deceased within the basement of 4715. Cleveland Avenue from apparent trauma to her health. Juvenile SDN, who had been transported to local hospital, sustained an ulnar fracture, multiple lacerations to her head, and bruising to the left side of her torso. Juvenile KIA sustained several bruises to her left shoulder, left arm, and left leg. Detectives spoke to, K spoke to KIA. Kay spent the night at her friend J.A.N.'s house. The two were in the basement watching a movie on a laptop in J.A.N.'s bedroom. S.D.N. was upstairs. S.D.N. came downstairs and told them a man broke into the house. The suspect then came downstairs and was holding J.A.N.'s softball bat. The suspect called them bitches and asked where the gun was. The girls ran to the corner of the bedroom. He started swinging the bat, striking all the female victims. K.I.A. was on the floor and curled up in the fetal position. 
and the suspect struck her on her left side. JAN was also struck a few times and collapsed. The suspect stopped and ran out. KA then ran outside shortly after and flagged down officers. KA described the suspect as being covered in blood when he arrived. She described him as a male in his mid-20s, tan skin, black hair, and a, and a bowl cut. She stated he had on a beige hoodie and blue jeans, being approximately five foot tall, and he was a little taller than her. She described him as skinny. Detective spoke with SDN. SDN stated she was in the kitchen fi fixing something to eat. The suspect entered the unlocked rear door. The suspect grabbed one of Jan's bats and started walking around the first floor. Somehow he didn't see her. She ran downstairs to warn the other girls. The suspect came downstairs and started swinging the bat. Jan got hit a lot and went unconscious. He stopped, said, I'm going to get a gun and went back upstairs. They could hear him walking around and KIA called the police. SDN said the subject, subject, suspect had blood on him and dark hair and tan skin. He was wearing a gray sh sweatshirt and jeans. Soto was taken into custody. When taken into custody, he was wearing a gray sweatshirt and blue jeans. He was covered in blood. He had minor lacerations to his hands and was treated and released from the hospital. After being advised of his Miranda rights, he explained that he beat up and stabbed the mailman when he saw the police arrive, so he ran. He explained he ran, he ran to a house that had a garage with a motorcycle in it. He went to the back door of the house and entered to the rear unlocked door. That described house was 4715 Cleveland. He said he found a bat in the kitchen. He recalled hitting the three kids in the basement with a bat. A bat was located in the upstairs bedroom with blood on it. That's the city complaint. With respect to the county complaint, there are two counts. Count one of two. That on March 27, 2024, in the county of Winnebago, Christian Soto committed the offense of attempt, attempt first degree murder. And the victim in that case is Lindsey Craig. Count two of two reads nearly identical. Christian Soto is charged with attempt first degree murder. The victim in that case is Keith Farney. The facts underlying the factual summary for this complaint. On March 27, 2024, police responded to the area of Florence Street and Eagleson Drive in Rockford, Illinois for a report of multiple stabbings. Upon arrival, Rockford City and Winnebago County personnel saw Soto fleeing from two stabbing victims with a knife. He was taken into custody. During the investigation, it was learned that Soto had broken into multiple homes nearby in, Rockford, in City of Rockford jurisdiction, and in doing so, had beat a young woman to death with a bat, stabbed two adults to death, and ran over a mailman who died from his injuries. Soto then forced his way into 4624 Florence Street, Rockford, Illinois, by breaking a window, and he began attacking Lindsey Craig with a knife. Craig fled the residence, and Soto chased her on foot to the front yard area of 2129 Eagleston Road, Rockford. This was captured on camera. Once at this location, Soto continued to attack Craig with a knife, causing multiple injuries. A passerby, you heard the sheriff talk about a good Samaritan. A passerby, Keith Farney, F-A-H-R-E-N-Y, was driving by in his gray Jeep, Illinois, in his gray Jeep, and saw this happening. He stopped to intervene, and Soto began to attack him with a knife, also causing multiple injuries. Soto entered Keith Farney's Jeep in an attempt to steal it. Farney pulled Christian Soto from the Jeep, but again was being attacked with a knife. It was at this time the police arrived and took Soto into custody. When doing so, Soto dropped the edge weapon he was using at Lindsey Craig's feet. Both Craig and Farney saw Soto taken into custody and confirmed that he was the subject that was attacking them with a knife. Both Farney and Craig are in serious condition. Craig is currently intubated at a local hospital and Soto, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Craig is currently intubated at a local hospital. 
So I'm going to attempt to do a bit of a summary in terms of the addresses. The first address was 2316 Holm Street. And it was that address that he killed Jacob Schubeck and Ramona Schubeck, who, as the factual summary indicates, he knew. The second address was 2217 Winneka Avenue. That was where the murder of Jay Larson occurred. The next we believe to be 4715 Cleveland Avenue, which is where the juveniles were attacked and J.A.N. was murdered. Next, 4803 Cleveland, which is the attempt murders on Weber, Volman, and Gilfillan. The last address being 4624 Florence Street. Those are the attempted murders of Lindsey Craig and Keith Barney. I have to say this. Soto was presumed innocent unless and until convicted, uh, found guilty by a jury or a court of law. As I mentioned, at 1.30 today, uh, we'll be seeking his detention. I'm confident that he'll be detained pretrial. We'll also provide you with copies of these complaints and the factual summary. Keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, um, the charges um, are likely to um, be different or, or there'll be more charges um, at the time of indictment um, and also that this investigation continues. This is the information that we know right now. Thank you. I have a question for Lou. There are a lot of mail carriers right now who do feel scared to go to work. Obviously, this is traumatizing for our whole community, but anything that you can say to them to make them feel better? No comment. We have addressed our employees, letter carriers, directly this morning at the postal facility. Thank you for your question. We mourn with the Postal Service family and the entire the family of all the victims mentioned today. Are there any potential federal charges because a mail carrier was involved? So I can speak to that. The answer is possibly. So. Um, as you know, this happened yesterday. We have charged it as we can. It occurred in Winnebago County. Um, discussions with um, our federal prosecutorial partners will occur in the upcoming days or weeks, um, and that will be discussed. So it's, it's possible. For those who are trying to find reason in all of this, is there any look into what the motive might have been at this point? So as a prosecutor, um, I almost never discuss motive uh, because it's not something that um, is required in, in the proof, you know, in a very technical way. Um, I understand that rightfully the public um, wants to provide some context, some answer as to why this occurred. Um, I don't. You heard in the factual summary that he indicated that he's saying um, that, you know, he smoked marijuana that may have been laced, um, and, and that's what he discussed. Um, but as I read the factual summary, there also seems to be a real consciousness of what he did, that he was conscious. Um, and, and it, it, so I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, and, and I'm not sure we will. Can you, uh, can, can you talk about how, what the relationship is between uh, uh, the suspect and, and, and Jacob? How well did they know each other? And had he been to the home before? Can you talk a little bit about that? I don't know any of that. Does anyone, Chief, perhaps? So we do have information that uh, Jacob and Christian have been friends for quite some time. As a matter of fact, to the point where it sounds like they grew up in the neighborhood together. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can answer this, Chief, or not. Uh, it has, it was a suspect, uh, you had prior contact with the suspect at all, or had, had you ever been to uh, the Jacob, Jacob's home prior to any issues? <coughs> So I can tell you we've had minimal contact um, at Christian's home, nothing that would have provided any indication that something like this was going to transpire. Okay. I can speak to that. For the mayor to, sorry, can I'm going to follow up on that. So um, in 2022, he was charged with a um, class four felony. I'm sorry, sir. Who is he? Uh, Soto. Well, uh, criminal damage to property. Um, he was alleged to have um, spun out his car on the Black Hawk, Black, Black Hawk Forest Preserve. 
so that was back in 2022 and then he's had some traffic matters again just a question for the mayor this is the first press conference i know that i've been to where i've seen city officials almost in tears while they're up here what has been the hardest part for you during all of this as a city it's just thing that you've seen uh so i appreciate the question question whitney um i don't know if i could sit here and stand and tell you all the worst parts i think you just think about all of it i mean you go back to sunday you think about all the employees who were at walmart you think about the jason and every kid who ever went to school with him. You think about his mom you think about his cousins aunts and uncles who all loved him and just gone for no no reason. Then you think about these four, they were doing what we all do, what you should all be doing. It's spring break. You have three girls watching a movie. I can't even comprehend that. Like every aspect. What can we do as a community moving forward? So appreciate that. Um, it sounds simple, but it's important. Be kind. There is plenty of time. And what we do really well as Rockford is, die, you know, digest and go over each and every detail where we could fix and do things differently there's time for that it's not today i i mean right now the focus is on these individuals who have lost their life this week their families making sure that they're getting the healing that they need that that neighborhood's getting the healing that they need those directly connected and uh quasi connected to them and then us as a community at large just coming together I mean, there's, uh, there's time for a lot of these discussions. Um, right now is not the time. Right now, us is be kind. And if you know someone who's hurting, I would even say, I, I'm looking at <coughs> local reporters who I saw yesterday. Um, you too are going through a lot. You've been to a lot and you've heard a lot. Seek help. Make sure that you're talking to someone because all of us are dealing with this differently you think about the law enforcement who first on the scene seeing some pretty horrific stuff um they all have families and kids and grandparents and aunts and uncles and neighbors and letter carriers that they love seek help make sure that you're not holding this in i mean now's not the time to hold this in now's the time to take advantage of the resources we've been blessed that rose grants uh, has afforded these services free of charge to the community um, and even if you don't feel comfortable going to those resources, I can understand that. There's a lot of other resources out there and we as a city want to be there to help support. Um, but I would say right now, the biggest things we can do is be kind, try to lift each other up and hold each other together and uh, show support for those who are going through the uh, most unspeakable of, uh, unspeakable of times. Mayor, I, I just wanted to follow up with something that, that you were talking about. Obviously, I sense um, the, the grief, the sadness, the pain um, of what this community has, what has been inflicted on the community. What do you say to those folks who are going through that but also feel anger um, that the sanctity of the community uh, has been changed? What do you say to them to help them through that process of not just the grief and the sadness, but dealing with um, feeling as though uh, they, they obviously something has been taken beyond the office. So first, uh, those are real feelings. They're fair and genuine feelings and they should be feeling that. I mean, you may hear uh, grief and sadness and, and uh, that from me. I'm also really pissed off. Um, I would say we are doing everything that we can in the most immediate term to make sure that we have healing for those families most impacted. Uh, 
but we're also a community that's strongly dedicated to public safety. Uh, I mean, I could rattle off a million things that we as a city have done from increasing the police budget by 40%, increasing the amount of technology and resources, the authorized budgeted number of officers. Public safety needs to be the number one priority. Uh, you need to feel safe at your home. You need to feel safe at your place of worship, your favorite restaurant, your favorite grocery store, traversing across our community. You need to feel safe. And we as a community understand that each and every day uh, that's a top priority and each and every day we can always be better uh, but I'm blessed that we have a fantastic chief who has fantastic leadership who has uh, amazing officers and a city council that is strongly supportive of uh, ensuring that our city remains safe can anyone speak to the chaos of a scene like this first responders are calling and then was there any uh, attempt to send out some type of message or warning to people in the area lock your doors stay inside of the situation in regards to that question, I'd say things were rapidly unfolding and the suspect was in custody in a relatively short amount of time. So in regards to being able to prepare messages and put anything out, a call was received, uh, paramedics, um, fire department, Brockford Police Department, we, Sheriff's Department, we all responded immediately. And he was in custody relatively quickly. What is the chaos like? How do you organize? You're getting all these calls coming in. Like, How do you organize who's going where and what's happening? Well, our world is often pretty chaotic, so the chaos is kind of where we reside quite often. Having multiple scenes yesterday was a bit overwhelming, but it was stated before, we have multiple partners in this area, um, state, federal, uh, local. We all band together. I sent out the text message as soon as I got the call that it was a cry for help, and I told them, we need help. And before we knew it, we had everybody that we had more personnel there than we needed yesterday. So that actually, you know, it, it took some of the burden off of us because we had, you know, even with the postal inspector showing up, they came out in droves and um, they were like, hey, I've got as many resources as I need. And we definitely appreciate all the support. By any chance, were there any drugs recovered for testing to see if anything was made? Um, that's part of our investigation. I can't speak on that right now. Any other items? There's plenty of evidence, but nothing I can speak of. Okay. Chief, how long would you say that the time was from, from the initial call to um, when you, know, you find the other suspect in, in custody? I think it was definitely less than 20 minutes. Less than 20 minutes from the initial call received at the 911 center to us getting there and ultimately suspect being in custody. Were any of your officers uh, or any law enforcement harmed in, in there uh, when they were trying to apprehend the, the suspect? Not with the Rockford Police Department, but I know there was a deputy that sustained the injury. So I'll let the sheriff speak on that. Yeah, one, one of my deputies, um, th again, thanks for the concern and asking the question. Yeah, one of my deputies, when he uh, did take him into custody, uh, he did get, um, he got hit a couple times and he did suffer a uh, stab wound to the uh, hand. But he's fine. He went, got treated and he, he's doing well. Did he enter a foot chase? Yes, he was in a foot chase, yeah. And he was going over fences in order to yes. catch up the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you.